let us start. So today we are going to talk about uh, thermal history. Uh, so there is a lot of material that I'm planning to cover today. Uh, let's see how far I can go. Uh, and it's kind of the, the nature of this, this topic, which is that it, it's just a long list of facts that uh, one has to eventually remember. So now, uh, as I go through this long list of facts, I, I don't expect you to remember them after, the, after this uh, lecture or even after this course. Uh, but I just want you to get exposed to it and then if you if you eventually want to work on cosmology after hearing it for a few times, then uh, gradually it sticks and you remember. But then we should start at some point, just going through the list of facts. Um, okay. Oh, and of course, there are many, many more facts that I'm, I'm skipping and just telling you uh, the, the small collection of them that are may, maybe a bit more, more important. So, um, so in the previous section, the previous lecture, we discussed uh the fact that as we go to the earlier times the universe becomes hot and then various the standard model degrees of freedom come in thermal equilibrium with each other uh, so now we want to go uh, far back in time when the temperature is very high we start from then there and then come forward in time and uh see what are the what are the significant effects it's significant processes uh, that happen during this history uh, so let's say let's imagine we go to temperatures much larger than 100 gv uh, so at this temperature uh, all the standard model degrees of freedom uh, are relativistic. And they are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Uh, now, uh, for relativistic degrees of freedom, if we calculate the uh, energy density using the, using the results that we had for both the statistics and Fermi statistics, we, we find in the relativistic limit, the density, energy density will be proportional to T to the fourth because that's the only uh, dimension full parameter that exists uh, or that is relevant in this limit. And then there is a coefficient which is, uh, where the, and then we have G, the number of internal degrees of freedom. So for instance, for photons, this G is two, for electrons is two. If the chemical potential is, for electrons is zero, then we put electrons and positrons together and we put, take it to be four for electrons and so on. For, for say pion, for each pion degree of freedom, it would be one. Uh, and then uh, there will be a factor which is one for bosons and seven over eight for fermions. Just because the phase space density is not identical in these two cases. Uh, and then the total energy density, uh, it's common to uh, formulated, you write it as some G star, 
as some effective total number of relativistic degrees of freedom times uh, that of one relativistic degree of freedom, which is two sigma Boltzmann times t to the four. So remember that for just uh, thermal radiation, thermal gas of photons, rho gamma would be four sigma b times t to the fourth, because g gamma is equal to two. So this factor in par parenthesis is just the contribution of single relativistic degree of freedom. And then G star is defined as the prefactor, which uh, now if we want to write it in terms of the, uh, in terms of the degrees of bosons and fermions that we have in, in our model, in a standard model, then it's, it will be sum over bosons times G times uh, G of bosons plus seven over eight sum over fermions times G of fan. Uh, also, uh, we know that in the relativistic limit, the pressure is given by one third rho. And as a result, S the entropy, which is rho plus P over T, the limit that chemical potential is negligible, which is the case, uh, is uh, four third rho over T. So we can also write S to be some G star S times uh, the entropy of a single relativistic degree of freedom. So this is the, you have four third times this factor. So we get eight over three sigma B times T. And uh, in, this, in this case, uh, G star S is the same as G star. The same thing that I defined above. Uh, now, what is this number for a standard model at this temperature? Uh, you just need to sum over all, all the standard model degrees of freedom. All of the quarks, gluons, uh, uh, leptons, uh, and so on. Uh, so this number adds up and of course, with these factors of seven over eight, so this number becomes something of order of a hundred. Not only of order, it's almost uh, very close to a hundred, a bit more than a hundred. Um, okay. So now, uh, now of course, with the expansion of the universe, the temperature decreases. Uh, and uh, as the temperature decreases, various uh, standard model degrees, various things happen. In particular, the standard model particles have masses. So the, uh, at least below the electroweak phase transition, they will have masses. And then uh, as the temperature goes down, they become uh, non-relativistic and temperature becomes much less than them. So what is the first particle that becomes non-relativistic is top uh, quark, which is the heaviest in the standard model. Uh, so let's, let's talk about, uh, uh, decoupling. Well, I shouldn't call it decoupling. Um, when top becomes non-relativistic. So what does it mean? It means that we go to temperatures much below M top. Um, so what happens when we go to these temperatures? 
Well, uh, we have processes in which uh, the top particles can decay, right? So the, we can have top, anti-top decay into other standard model degrees of freedom. So T plus T bar can go to two gluons or can go to two gamma and so on, other standard model degrees of freedom which are light. So what happens, what happens to the number density of uh, these particles after the temperature goes down? The number density uh, in thermal equilibrium after the particle becomes non relativistic, it drops exponentially, right? So the number density uh, of top particles be becomes, so this is, I think, one of your exercises, it becomes. Uh, M top times the temperature divided by two pi to the three has e to the minus M over T. Uh, and also the energy density is approximately, since it is non-relativistic, it's approximately the mass times the number density. So both of them are uh, go to zero exponentially. So when uh, mt is much bigger than t, this is uh, this uh, goes to zero. And therefore, they won't uh, they won't make a significant contribution to the energy density and uh, and to the entropy of the universe. So what does it mean? It means that this effective number of relativistic degrees of freedom that we define here is it of course reduced after below this temperature. So we will have uh, below this temperature, we will have delta G star equals minus seven over eight times uh, three times four, which is minus 21 over two. So seven over eight comes from the fact that top is a fermion. Uh, three is the number of colors. And then four is because you have two uh, two is spin degrees of freedom for top and two for uh, anti-top. So T and T bar uh, with two uh, uh, two is spin degrees of freedom. Um, now what happens to the, what happens to the temperature uh, when this happens, when uh, one, one relativistic degree of freedom becomes non-relativistic, it decays into other ones. What happens to the temperature? Uh, that we can determine using the fact that we are uh, we are in thermal equilibrium or approximate thermal equilibrium. So uh, uh, temperature after. So what is the implication of thermal equilibrium? It, the implication is that the total entropy is conserved. So if we talk about entropy density, uh, then since, uh, since the universe is expanding, the entropy density, so total S is because entropy density times volume, since the universe is expanding, the, the conservation of total entropy means that the entropy density goes as one over AQ. 
Uh, now on the other hand, uh, we said that S is equal to uh, G star S, some number of relativistic degrees of freedom times um, eight over three sigma B T Q. So this implies that if S goes as one over A Q, then it implies that T will go as one over G the star S to the power one third times A. So if the number of relativistic degrees of freedom is conserved, then uh, temperature drops as one over A. On the other hand, if the number of relativistic degrees of freedom changes, like when we go from above the uh, mass temperature above the mass of top to uh, temperatures well below mass of top, uh, so they, they decay into, or they annihilate into other uh, degrees of freedom, then, uh, the, then the temperature will not just go as one over A, they will be, since G star has decreased, the, the behavior of temperature will be a little bit, or the, the final temperature will be a bit larger than what you would accept from the, from just redshift. So if I want to plot it, uh, so if we tr plot log of the temperature in terms of log of the scale factor, then, uh, then we would have a, We would have a curve that or we have a line corresponding to t proportional to one over a, uh, but the real uh, so the real behavior would be something along this curve, and then uh, it moves slightly above at the at the temperatures when top decouples. So here is. Uh, oops. Uh, um, Any questions so far? Okay, so the same thing happens to other uh, heavy the standard model degrees of freedom, like to Higgs, to W and C bosons, uh, to charm and bottom quark. Uh, so then, uh, uh, every time this happens, the number of relativistic degrees of freedom goes down a similar thing happens to the temperature. So there is no qualitative difference with what I said. Now then one thing that happens at temperature of order one GeV, which is qualitatively different is that we will have a QCD phase transition.
uh, because as the energy is below, well below one GV, QCD becomes uh, strongly coupled and then we will have uh, new asymptotic degrees of freedom, uh, which are, which most of them have masses of order. So like baryons and mesons uh, and globals, uh, but most of these are heavy. They have masses of order of GV uh, the light ones are the the pions. So effectively, well below this phase transition, what survives uh, is uh, pi zero and uh, pi plus and pi minus, uh, which are still approximately relativistic, uh, plus the plus baryons, so protons and neutrons, uh, and this some of these survive, not because they are relativistic; they have mass of order one GV, so well below uh, temperature when T is much less than. 1 GV, then they are non relativistic. However, they have non zero chemical potential. So, we, this we know it from the observations today, since basically because we exist, uh, we know that the baryon number, which is, a, which is a conserved quantity of the standard model, that is non zero. So, therefore, uh, what I said above was assuming that the chemical potential is zero, but in reality, the chemical potential for baryons is not zero. So below, when we go to temperatures below their mass, there will be some residual amount of baryons. But this is very small. So this chemical potential is very small and the number of baryons that we have is tiny. Uh, so their contribution, which is, so what we know, let me just write it down. So the, uh, we have mu baryon not equal to zero and baryon number is conserved. So we have in B, what does, what does conservation of baryon number mean? It means that uh, the number density will uh, be dilute with the expansion of universe as one over a q. So the total number is conserved, therefore the number density just goes as one over a q. So mb would be, would go as one over a q, the property of anything that is conserved, which implies that the number of baryons divided by the entropy density, which also goes as one over a q, if you are in thermal equilibrium, that is a constant. However, this constant is extremely small, something over the 10 to the minus 10 or so. Um, which means that uh, uh, the contribution of these parents to the energy density of the universe is negligible until we go to much, much lower temperatures. So at that moment, we can ignore their contribution to the energy density uh, and therefore to the, uh, to the Friedman equation, for instance. Uh, those can be neglected, but we should keep in mind that there is this non-zero density of barons. And these, are, these remain in thermal equilibrium with, with the rest of the, with the rest of the uh, the standard model degrees of freedom because they, they interact with uh, with electrons and with neutrinos and those all remain in thermal equilibrium with uh, with photons. Uh, okay, so we have baryons and they are in thermal equilibrium. The, the number is conserved and is small. Of course, then we go to lower temperatures and also pions will become non-relativistic. And again, the same thing happens to pions. They, 
they again decay into other the standard model. Degrees of freedom, the G star, the effective number uh, to say degrees of freedom again goes down. Of course, it goes down a lot during QCD phase transition uh, because uh, there were a lot of gluons and then light quarks that basically all of them uh, disappear and we only get uh, the three pions. Uh, okay, any questions so far? Okay, then another important thing that happens is the, again, this one is qualitatively different. So another important thing that happened is neutrino decoupling. So this happens at temperature of order one MeV. And we are going to derive this T of order one MeV or estimate. Uh, so what are the processes that keep neutrinos in equilibrium with photons or with the rest of the plasma? Uh, the main processes are uh, the, the weak interactions, the uh, four Fermi interactions. So there is uh, is he going to Mu plus E, and then we have the process of mu plus new bar going to E plus plus E minus. So these are the four Fermi interactions. And the question that we want to ask is that so these processes are weak interactions. Uh, now we are at temperatures well below the mass of the W bosons and Z bosons. So the uh, so we are in a regime in which we can apply the Fermi theory uh, for the interactions of, for the weak interactions. Uh, and the question that we want to ask is that we want to estimate the rate of these processes and see if the rate of these processes, uh, how does it change it time, the rate? Is it, uh, fast enough to sustain thermal equilibrium or it is too slow? Because we should remember that the universe is expanding. So of course, if we put them in a box and wait forever, then they will come into thermal equilibrium. But since the universe is expanding, this notion of thermal equilibrium is an approximate notion. We, uh, in fact, in real life, it is always an approximate notion. We never wait for forever. Uh, so the, the real question is that if the rate of processes uh, are fast enough compared to the time that we can, we are going to wait or not fast enough. And here, the being fast or not being fast is compared uh, to the expansion rate of the universe. So, okay, so let us start uh with the estimate of the rate so these are processes which uh as i said they they will have uh, they are they can be described by the four fermi interactions whose amplitude is proportional to g fermi right uh, which is of order of uh, 10 to the minus 5 uh gv uh one over gv square which is something of order of one over the mass of the w or uh z boson squared times the coupling constant uh okay so the amplitude is proportional to that and therefore the cross section for these processes would be proportional to G Fermi square. 
Uh, now, uh, how do we determine the rate given some total cross section? How do we estimate the rate? So we want to know the rate gamma given sigma. So we estimate it like that. We imagine our particle sitting at some point. We consider cylinder uh, with cross section sigma and uh, length delta x. So how many, we ask how many target particles are inside this volume. Uh, the number of target par particles in this volume is n times the volume, which is sigma times delta x. And uh, so sigma, importantly, is the cross section, right? So this, this, this particle goes through here, they will interact. Uh, Okay, so now, uh, so this will be the, so if this particle go through this, uh, uh, well, okay, so now these particles have some typical speeds, the typical rel relative speed with respect to each other, right? So that delta X is, I'm going to consider those particles that during some, time period delta t will actually go through uh, this cross section. So therefore this delta x should be, I should take it to be of order of v times delta t. And this will be the number of events in that time interval. So now if I want to find the rate gamma, is the number of events divided by delta t, which will be n times sigma times v. The v is the relative speed uh, of, between the two particles that are interacting. In this case, we are talking, in this example, for instance, we are talking about the interaction of a neutrino with an electron. Or if we look at this diagram from above, then interaction of two neutrinos with each other. So this number density would be the number density of the target particle, which would be neutrinos if we are looking at, or anti-neutrinos when we are looking at this process, and will be, will be electrons if we are looking at this process. Uh, relative velocity is uh, approximately one because we are at temperatures above the mass of this particle. Uh, so, uh, v is approximately one. What is n? n is um, again, since these are relativistic particles, n would be of order t q basically about dimensional analysis. And the cross section, we said it is proportional to G Fermi, but cross section has dimension of uh, area, while G Fermi squared has the, G Fermi has the dimension of length squared. So G Fermi squared will have the limit, dimension of length to the force. So to make cross section something with dimension of area, we have to multiply by T squared. Again, because that's the only, relevant energy is getting this problem. So what does it tell us? It tells us that gamma is approximately, this is GF squared, gamma is approximately GF squared times T to the fifth. Okay, so this, uh, this is our estimate of the rate at some given temperature. Now let us also remember how the, how the radiation dominated cosmology works because the temperature is also related to the expansion rate in, in radiation 
during radiation domination. So we have radiation dominated cosmology. Uh, we remember that the Friedman equation is eight pi g third rho. And now, so I, I only do a very crude estimates in this lecture, uh, just to get the idea. Of course, this can, this can be all done much more rigorously, but it takes much more time to go, or much more time and perhaps also more uh, computational power. Sometimes they need, uh, uh, or it would be much easier to do it uh, using computer. So here we are only going to do estimate. So what is rho? Rho in, uh, radiation domination is proportional to t to the fourth with some proportionality constant which depends on the number of degrees of freedom by some order one number. Uh, so this goes at t to the fourth and I'm going to introduce the Planck mass. So Planck mass is uh, defined as one over the square root of g newton. Sometimes they define it as one over eight pi g they can reduce Planck mass. Again, for our estimates, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and this is a massive scale. This is a huge massive scale compared to the standard model massive scale. So this is something of order 10 to the 19 uh, GeV. Or in terms of gram, it's something of order 10 to the minus five gram, which is, uh, again, compared to particle physics massive scale is huge, it's like, the mass of a living uh, uh, cell or something. Uh, okay, so now, uh, now what is the time dependence? So H, so we, this, we, we learned that H is of order T squared over M Planck. H the Hubble goes as one over T in radiation domination, which means the temperature is proportional to one over T to the one half. So therefore, if we go back here, we learn that gamma, the rate of, uh, the rate of this process that we were considering, it goes as T to the minus five over two. So with time, it is uh, the rate of this process uh, becomes slower and slower. As T increases, gamma, the rate becomes slower. Now, what is, uh, so what is the relevant question to ask? So we have this Hubble scale, which is the expansion rate. Hubble was H, A dot over A. Is effective, Hubble is effectively the time it takes for the size of the universe to double or for a co-moving, fixed co-moving box to double its size, its physical size. So uh, we want, you can ask if, if we have a neutrino, is it gonna see another neutrino or another particle in a Hubble time? Uh, if we want to ask that question, then the, we should multiply the rate by a Hubble time, which is one over H. So we consider gamma over H. And if we, uh, if we use our, our estimates, so we see that at time, at some time T, that uh, quantity goes as T to the minus three half because gamma goes as t to the minus five over two and h is one over t. So this ratio goes as t to the minus three half. Now, therefore, if at some time t1, uh, this ratio is less than one, then at some t2 after T1, the ratio would be even smaller, right? Because the ratio is uh, dropping with time. So the gamma of T2 over H of T2 will be less than gamma of T1 
over h of t1. Then it will be even less than, even less less than one, or even more less than one. Uh, which, uh, which, what does it mean? It means that if during a Hubble time, during a time in which the the size of the universe doubled, if my neutrino didn't see another particle during the next Hubble time, it's even less like it's it's uh, even less likely for it to see another particle. Uh, the, what is the original reason for that is because of the dilution. So since everything is diluting with this expansion, it becomes harder and harder for these neutrinos to see another particles and then scatter. Uh, that, is, that means that they go out of equilibrium. If they don't see other particles to scatter with them, then they won't uh, maintain the equilibrium. And then we say they decouple. So, the decoupling is determined by finding uh, the point when gamma becomes of order of h. And that gives us the temperature. Uh, so decoupling means gamma of order h. Uh, which is what so we gamma we know is gf squared times t to the fifth and h is t squared over m Planck, which tells us that t decoupling uh, is of order one over g fermi squared times m Planck to the power one third which if we plug in numbers, so G Fermi again is 10 to the minus five uh, inverse GV squared, and Planck is 10 to the 19 GV. So this ratio, it becomes something of order one MeV. Um, okay, below this temperature, we can just treat neutrinos as free particles, free massless particles, uh, which we have learned from before that if we just have uh, free relativistic particles, we we'll start their life in some in a thermal distribution, then they maintain this thermal distribution with time, right? So we consider something with black body radiation, and then we, we learn that it remains black body. Here, these neutrinos are fermions, so they, fall, uh, they have Fermi, Fermi Dirac distribution. But the same argument also applies here. They maintain this Fermi Dirac distribution as long as they are relativistic, except that the temperature would uh, redshift as one over A. We also know that this temperature at, at the, before the decoupling was the same as the temperature of the rest of the standard model, in particular, the same as the temperature of the photons. So if nothing else happened afterward, the temperature of the neutrinos on the temperature of photons would be the same. They would both redshift as one over A. Uh, however, something will happen shortly after, and then these two temperatures will uh, become different from each other. And that something is uh, electron positron annihilation. So we learned that when we uh, go below the, some mass threshold, so that some relativistic degree of freedom becomes non-relativistic, then we have a period in which the temperature of the rest of relativistic degrees of freedom increases because you can think of it as particles annihilating into the remaining relativistic degrees of freedom. Now, because neutrinos are decoupled from this story, this 
E plus, E minus annihilation wouldn't affect their temperature, but it will affect photon temperature. And as a result, the two, there will be a mismatch between the temperature of photons and neutrinos afterward. Uh, okay, any questions so far? All right, so let us talk a bit more about E plus E minus annihilation. So we want, uh, we, we are now going to consider when, uh, when T goes, when T goes uh, below, uh, we want to consider when uh, T becomes less than ME. No. Okay, so uh, so what do we have here? We are the neutrinos have already decoupled. So here, what we have is gamma e plus e minus, and then some baryons. Uh, now, if we ask about uh, the number of relativistic degrees of freedom in this sector. So I, I put this index gamma E here. So therefore this is G star only in this sector, which are this decoupled together. I'm not including neutrinos in this. And if we go to temperature, which is uh, much higher than M electron, then uh, there will be, so a temperature is much larger than M electron, there will be two coming from two gammas, two photons. And then there will be uh, seven over eight times four, four coming from electrons and positrons, which are the relativists and seven over eight because they are fermions. So this is 11 over two. This is when temperature is larger than any. Uh, when temperature is well below ME, then the, relative, the number of relativistic there is of freedom in this sector will be just two, only the two polarization of fault. Okay, now what happens to the temperature? Now we learned that from the conservation of um, entropy, uh, we know that temperature at time T2 divided by temperature at time T1 is equal to um, is equal to A1 divided by A2. Uh, times uh, G star S at time T1 divided by G star S at time T2 to power one third. So let's say this is 
let's say this is time uh, T1, the earlier time, and this is time T2, the later. Uh, what about the neutrino temperature? Uh, for the neutrino temperature, we have a simpler relation. Since they decouple, then this is uh, approximate. And later, I'll say why I call this approximate. Uh, this will be A1 over A2. So then during this transition, the number of relativistic degrees of freedom in the neutrino sector doesn't change. So therefore they just redshift with the scale factor. The other fact that we know is that they start to be uh, with the same temperature. So T, and by T, I really mean the T of photons. So I, I could have denoted it by T gamma, but uh, let's just call it T. So any, anytime I write T is T gamma. So T, T at time T1, at the early time, the two, uh, the two sector had the same temperature. Okay, so now we combine this, uh, these uh, three equations to learn that uh, T at time T2 divided by T nu at time T2 uh, is equal to uh, this ratio, this ratio is just a ratio of these two factors, so it's 11 over 4. Is 11 over 4 to power 1 set. So what we learn is that the temperature in the neutrino sector is slightly below the temperature in the temperature of photons. After, after the electron positron annihilation. And then they redshift with the scale factor in the same way. Um, well, until, so if neutrinos have mass, which we know they should have, at least some of them should have mass, then eventually the neutrinos become relativistic and then the story changes. But as long as they are relativistic, then the two temperatures remain. Uh, the, the ratio of the temperatures remains the same as this number. Uh, why did I use approximation here? Because this electron positron annihilation, it happens at temperatures of order of m electron, which is not too far below one MeV, right? So it's not, of course, these processes are not instantaneous. They, it takes some time for these decouplings to happen and also these annihilations to happen. As a result, neutrinos were not exactly decoupled when E plus E minus annihilations happen. So some of, some of these uh, annihilations could also go in the neutrino sector, uh, which, which would mean that this, is, this, is, this equality won't be exact. But it's a very good approximation. Uh, there's a tiny correction too, which is usually usually denoted by an effective. So sometimes I might see an effective for neutrinos, and this is one reason for an effective being different. So now we think there are three neutrino. Uh, neutrino flavors, but in cosmology, you often see an effective for neutrinos, which is not exactly three. And this is one reason why it is not exactly three, because you want to use simple formulas uh, using some number of uh, neutrinos. But in order to use a simple formula, then you should change an effective to be the, the slightly different from three to take into account the fact that they were not completely decoupled from E plus and minus when they decouple, when they annihilate. All right, any question about this part?
Um, okay, then the next thing. So I warned you, is, there is a long list of facts. So the next thing is BBN, Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, um, which uh, interestingly, it also happens around the same temperature of one MeV. Uh, so what is Big Bang Nucleosynthesis is the, uh, the synthesis, the formation of uh, nuclei, uh, during this thermal history. So for instance, the formation of uh, other stable nuclei than hydrogen, which is just a proton. So we, the formation of helium and lithium and this uh, heavier nu nuclei of the heavier elements. Uh, so what is, what is the story there? So the story is that so we said there will be, there is a non-zero, there is a non-zero baryon number. Um, we observe it today, we know non-zero baryon number is a conserved number, therefore they have, uh, they should be conserved also at, at those earlier times. Uh, now, bar, baryons, consists of protons and neutrons, right? And so, so this non-zero baryon number at early times, it, it is distributed between uh, so we have baryons, which is made of neutrons or let me write the formula instead of words. N baryon is equal to N neutrons plus N protons. Uh, but the mass of neutron and mass, mass of proton, uh, uh, there's a difference between their mass. Uh, so Q, which is Mn minus Mp, this is, approximately again one MeV. And uh, there's no conservation of, uh, there's no conservation law that forbids the, uh, a process that takes a neutron uh, and produces, a, uh, exchanges a neutron with a proton or vice versa. So there are various processes that, uh, that take, take uh, take new, uh, neutrons and protons, uh, neutrons into protons and, uh, and the other way around. And they are in, in thermal equilibrium as, as long as the universe is hot enough. Uh, so what do we have here? We have basically two energy levels. That's one way to think about it. There are two energy levels with energy difference Q uh, if we are in thermal equilibrium, what it uh, what thermal equilibrium implies is that the number of neutrinos divided, not neutrinos, the number of neutrons divided by the number of protons uh, at, in at thermal equilibrium will be equal to e to the would be this ratio will be determined by the Boltzmann factor. So it will be given by e to the minus q, the energy difference between these two states divided by the temperature. So at temperatures well below MeV, the number of neutrons becomes uh, very small, exponentially small. So if you want to form heavier elements, uh, this has to be done uh, before the temperature falls well below one MeV because heavier elements contain neutrons. Of course, when neutron is captured inside the a nucleus of a heavier, heavier element like He, uh, like he helium a nucleus, then it remains stable. It has a much, much longer lifetime. 
but if it is just free outside of a nucleus, then it will uh, it will decay. So, so around the same time, before the tem temperature goes much lower than one MeV, this uh, some of these neutrinos will be captured into a deut deuterium, into helium, uh, tritium, and so on. And this process is called uh, the nucleosynthesis, cosmological big bang nucleosynthesis. And uh, so I don't, I'm not going to talk much about this. The only thing is that uh, because, because of this, uh, this fact that the number of neutrinos at lower temperatures is going to deplete very fast. And because of various bottlenecks in formation of this, uh, this nuclei, this heavier nuclei, uh, this PBN is a very sensitive process. So many models of a beyond the standard, beyond the standard model physics, many, many BSM models, they, they are ruled out by the fact that they would change uh, the, the thermal history uh, and as a result they will change the result of big bang nucleosynthesis so dramatically that it won't agree with the with the current observation uh, so it's important to keep in mind that there is this very sensitive process in which various things have to work together in a in a delicate way in order to produce the right abundance of the nuclei that we see. Of course, there are still some pauses, but uh, overall it's a relative, we have a relatively satisfactory story uh, of uh, generation of this nuclear. So we don't want to modify it by orders of magnitude because of some, uh, some BSM model. Uh, okay, so that's it about BBM. Uh, any question? Okay, it seems that my my iPad has now an issue. Uh, let me pause. Okay, so the last object is um, uh, is a recombination uh, and uh, photon decoupling. So let us see what, what has remained uh, in this story. So we have photons and electrons. So Electrons and positrons annihilate, but there is also a non-zero chemical potential for electrons because the universe is overall neutral, uh, uh, electrically neutral, which means that if we have non-zero non uh, number of protons, there should also be a non-zero number of electrons. And, uh, and if, even though we have some, we form some nucleons, even though some of the barons are uh, therefore are in the form of neutrons, not protons. Most of them are protons. 
And most of the variants are in the form of uh, uh, free protons uh, before, before we get to this area of recombination that I'm gonna talk about. So we mainly have e plus, uh, photons, uh, electrons, protons, and then one other thing that I didn't talk about, but now we are going to talk about are hydrogen atoms. So when electrons and protons, they combine or recombine to form hydrogen atoms. So this process goes both. Um, so for now, we are going to ignore the other, the other elements. Uh, also, we are going to ignore neutrinos. They are decoupled. They are just evolving for themselves. So these are now the, and we are going to temperatures well below what we were we were before. So now we are uh, coming down to test. We, before we were talking about temperatures of order one MeV, of order one MeV, which is of order of the mass of the electron. Now we are coming down to temperatures of order of the binding energy of the hydrogen atom, which is uh, temperatures of order EV or 10 EV. Uh, and at this temperature, uh, except gamma, all these other particles are non-relativistic and the number densities are given by the, the same formula. Importantly, they have non-zero chemical potential. And uh, since we are in we have we are in equilibrium, then we should have mu e plus mu p equal to mu h. So now we can consider. Uh, oh yeah, maybe let me also say that so. Uh, what what is maintaining this equilibrium? So what is maintaining this equilibrium is uh, first of all the interactions between photons and electrons. So this is this process, which is called Thomson. So gamma gamma e. So this is. Uh, Thompson is scattering, whose cross section is relatively big, which is because it's proportional to one over Me square, uh, which is much lighter than proton. Uh, so this is the process that couples uh, gamma photons to electrons. And then we have uh, the protons that are coupled uh, to electrons. So this is called uh, Coulomb scattering. Uh, because it's a charged particle, so they have a uh, Coulomb interaction. Uh, well, and of course here, I, I missed an important thing. When E plus and E minus, they uh, combine, they form a hydrogen atom, but they emit a photon. And vice versa, the hydrogen atom can uh, absorb a photon and then uh, ionize into E plus and E minus. So these are the three, the three processes that maintain equilibrium between these three, uh, between these uh, four, uh, four particles. Now, 
because of because of the efficiency of this process, this Thompson scattering, the universe at this time is opaque. So elect the photons will keep scattering off the electron. Therefore, they don't freely stream. So if you if we were to leave there and try to look somewhere, uh, of course, it would be very would be a very inconvenient environment. But apart from that, you wouldn't see too far because the universe would be very opaque. Photons wouldn't travel uh, the straight for a long time. They would keep uh, getting scattered. Uh, and so what is going to happen, what we are going to see is that um, when temperature falls uh, sufficiently below the binding energy of the hydrogen atom, then uh, like this is of course the sim simple general idea when temperature is well below the binding energy of the hydrogen atom, most of these electrons and protons will combine into hydrogen atoms and they become neutral. Uh, and then the photons can travel uh, without being scattered much. So uh, that's, the, that's the simple picture. The question is that what is that temperature? Of course, the most naive estimate would be that that temperature for transition is the binding energy of the hydrogen atom, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, what so we have uh, b the binding energy of the hydrogen atom which is me plus mp minus mh which is 13.6 electron so the naive guess would be that the temperature is below that we would have most of these electrons and positrons combined universe becomes neutral we have the coupling of photons and recombination uh, but this is not the case. Uh, and this is not the case because the number of photons is much, much bigger than the number of electrons and positrons. So even at temperatures below 13.6 electron volt, the tail of the black body radiation for, uh, for photons is uh, large enough to ionize hydrogen atoms. So to determine this a bit more quantitatively, we we work a little, we, we manipulate a bit these equations to get rid of the chemical potentials which are unknown here. At least this mu h is unknown. So we have this equation, we can combine this to get rid of uh, mu h in this equation. So let us look at this combination. If I divide NH by NE times NP, uh, then this, because, because of the relation between the chemical potentials, in this ratio, the chemical potentials will, be, will cancel with each other. So what we get is uh, two pi over ME times T to the three halves, so now in the prefactor, I am setting M, I, I, the mass of the hydrogen atom to be the same as M proton. Importantly, I'm not doing it the same thing in the exponent. But it's safe to do it in the prefactor. It doesn't matter. Uh, now, what else do we know? We know that the universe is neutral. So the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. Um, so therefore, this ratio is basically NH divided by NE squared. Uh, what else do we know? What, the other thing is that the baryons are mainly in protons and hydrogen atoms. So the other heavier elements that were heavier nuclear that were made, they were, uh, there isn't too many of them. Most of, most of the baryons are actually protons and they are either free protons or inside this hydrogen. Now, uh, let us look at the fraction. 
So we can talk about the fraction of electron as the number of electrons divided by the total number of baryons, which is the same as number of protons divided by total number of baryons. And, uh, and then what we learn is that, uh, so therefore NE is, and B, so what I'm going to do is that to write this equation that I have here, I want to write it as an equation for Xe, just the fraction of electron in terms of total number of baryons, and then uh, express everything in terms of that. Uh, how, how can we do it? Well, NH is NB minus, uh, NP, so we can write it as NB times one minus NP over NB, which is again the fraction of electrons because of neutrality. So therefore that ratio that we had is uh, equal to uh, one minus XE divided by NB times XE squared. So this ratio that I had here is can be written in this form in terms of the fraction of the electrons. Uh, and this is equal to uh, so this is equal to that same object. Um, Now, another thing that we can do is that we also have a knowledge of what is MB, the number of baryons. For instance, we know omega baryon today, the contribution of baryons to the energy density of the universe today. We also know H naught today, the Hubble rate today. So if I know omega baryon and H naught, I can determine what is the number density of uh, what is the energy density and what is the number density of baryons today from omega baryon and the observation of H now. Okay, so we know the number density of baryons today. We also know omega radiation today. So we, from that, we can also determine the number density of photons today. And we know that the ratio of these two is conserved. Both of them dilute as one over AQ. So therefore we can find this ratio eta B, which is the number of baryons divided by the number of photons. And this is constant. This constant, we, we, we talked about it some time ago, earlier in this lecture, is related to the number of baryons divided by entropy density, uh, because most of the entropy density or the big part of the entropy density comes from the photons. Uh, and at least an order one, so up to an order one number, this is the same thing. And this ratio is extremely small. This is of order 10 to the minus 10. Okay, we also know what is in gamma at some given temperature. It's just the black body, black body spectrum we can, as a function of temperature, we can determine the number number density of photons. So it will be proportional to Q, T cube. And then the proportionality constant is some, the result of some integral, some Riemann zeta function uh, divided by twice zeta three divided by pi squared. Okay, so now, we basically have everything to determine Xe, the fraction of electron. And of course, this is the, uh, yeah, maybe I should have emphasized it. This is the fraction of free electrons, electrons which are not captured inside hydrogen atoms. Right, when we write this equation here, this, uh, these electrons, protons and hydrogen atoms, uh, these electrons are the ones which are free. Protons are the free ones and hydrogen atoms are then they are combined. So these are 
uh, at this level, they are considered as independent degrees of freedom. Okay, so now we can put together this, uh, these three, uh, combine these three equations uh, to find that uh, one minus xe divided by xe squared is equal to two zeta of three divided by pi squared, uh, two pi t divided by me to power three over two, eta b times e to the b over t. Okay, so the important factor in this formula is this last two factors. Uh, so let us see what happens to uh, If we go to temperatures much bigger than uh, the binding energy of hydrogen atom, uh, obviously we, what they would expect is that most of the hydrogen atoms are ionized. So most of uh, electrons are just free electrons. Most of the protons are just free protons. What does it mean? It means that Xe, the ratio of free electrons over the total number of barons would be just very close to one. And therefore, Xe close to one, therefore this ratio is close to zero. Remember that this ratio was coming from the, the numerator in this ratio was coming from the number of hydrogen atoms. So at high temperature, the number density of hydrogen atoms is close to zero. And therefore the ratio, the fraction of free electrons is close to one. Uh, so here T much larger than B, X E is close to one. Now as temperature falls, this exponential, oh, and by the way, so X E close to one, which means that this ratio is very small, it's close to zero. And that is smallness comes from the fact that eta B is extremely small in this equation. So this eta B remember is over 10 to minus 10 and this exponential, when T is much larger than B, this exponential is uh, not very, uh, very big, it's over the one. Uh, on the other hand, when temperature goes, becomes very small, much smaller than uh, B, then this exponential becomes big and compensates for the small eta B. So at that point, this ratio becomes big, which means that Xe becomes less than one, much less than one. So when T is much less than B, then Xe becomes much less than one. The question is that when then this transition happen, and this transition happens, so again, if you look at x e, it is one as a function of temperature. And then at some point it falls. Well, from this equation, you would expect that it falls basically to zero exponential. Uh, and the question is that when is, what is this transition? So this transition, is at the temperature, which we call it T recombination, which is of order uh, 0.3 electron volt, which is much, much smaller than the binding energy of the hydrogen atom. Why, why is it so much smaller? Why should we wait so much, so long until, uh, this X E becomes less than one is because of this small prefactor. So we need this exponential to become really big to beat this small prefactor, which comes from this small ratio of variance to photons. So that's essentially the reason for the fact that recombination temperature is much, much smaller than the binding energy of the hydrogen atom, which I remind you is 13.6 electron. Uh, of course, in reality, this equation is not, doesn't remain valid at uh, arbitrarily 
low temperature. So this here, I shouldn't write temperature. This is really time. Or if you like one over temperature, related to one over temperature. Just, let's just call it time. Uh, so th this is the direction in which uh, time goes forward and there, therefore temperature fall. So in reality, what happens is that the, this, this, this uh, processes that we are considering, they go out of equilibrium. So the, therefore the number of number density of electrons wouldn't just go all the way to zero. They, at some point they decouple, but the state, there will be much fewer electrons than before exponentially a smaller number of uh, orders of magnitude fewer electrons than before and therefore uh, in this part of the diagram photons are decoupled so the thompson is scattering is not efficient enough to uh, keep photons uh, coupled to electrons okay I'm, I'm over time, but this, I finished uh, going through the whole list. Any questions? 